Hello and welcome to the first episode of season two of the Wealth Witch podcast. Wow, what a milestone. I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about season two. Um, I wanted to chat really briefly about the new podcast network that I'm a part of. I um, was so, so honored to be asked by Shane Bryan to come be a part of the Bad Boys Media podcast group, which is comprised of two networks, Bad Boys Media and Extraordinary Media. And so originally, and if you'll remember in the announcement, if you listen to the announcement from the end of season one, I announced that I was going to be part of Extraordinary Media. And at the time, that really felt like that was the right place for the Wealth Witch podcast. Um, there's some incredible, incredible uh, spiritually based um, and motivated podcasts on that network. And it felt like that would be the best home for the Wealth Witch podcast. But as I've been stepping into you know, my direction for season two and really where I'm feeling I want to take these conversations, um, and, and talking to Shane about that and about my feeling for the direction of the podcast, we've actually decided that Bad Boys is a better home for the Wealth Witch podcast. So it's the same, they're both under the same umbrella, but um, I am now officially a member of Bad Boys Media, um, and that's where the Wealth Witch podcast, that's the channel that the Wealth Witch podcast will be housed under. So. Thanks so much to Shane and his team for all the hard work on getting season two up and off the ground. I know you're going to love it. Um, so just wanted to give that little shout out here at the beginning of the podcast and also wanted to give a shout out to my incredible husband, Sean Barnett, who was also signed to Bad Boys Media and has a brand new podcast on the network called The Sage Surfer, Musings from the Lineup. And I'm so proud of him. He, this podcast has really jumped off. It's an incredible, incredible journey, um, you know, through Sean's psyche, I think. But, you know, Sean is just this wealth of wisdom and knowledge around the occult and occult teachings and um, ancient wisdom and knowledge. And he's sharing all of that in a real palatable way. Um, and so I just really encourage you to go check out his podcast, support his podcast. If you love mine, I know you'll love his. Uh, we will put the link to his podcast in the show notes so you can easily go and access that. And if you love his podcast, leave him a review. So I want to just briefly touch on um, that there is a new way to subscribe to Apple Podcasts. So if you're new here, you end up loving the show and you want to subscribe, you actually no longer subscribe on Apple, you follow. So at the top of your screen, you'll see a little plus sign there um, and you can just hit that to follow the show if you are listening on Apple Podcasts. I think that's all the announcements I have to make today. Uh, so I really wanted this episode to be a little bit about where we're going this season. I, as I mentioned in the season one recap, I felt like season one was a little bit all over the place. It ended up being more along the lines of like my personal journal in a podcast, which was great um, for season one. But this season, I'm really interested in diving deeply into the conversations that I feel are relevant right now at this time in humanity's history. And so what that looks like for me is that we're going to be diving into and talking about topics that are highly controversial. And, you know, I'm assuming that, um, I'm going to have less positive reviews and less follows for a little while until we really uh, dive deeply into the niche that wants to be receiving this type of information. Wealth is a mindset. And if you've been following the podcast for long, you know that that's something that I always talk about, about the fact that you are the most powerful creator in your reality that you have everything you need already inside to create the life that you deeply desire. Um, I'm here talking to you on this podcast because I believe that when we find mentors and teachers that we resonate with, 
we have the ability to get to the places that we were already going faster. So it's like, we're gonna reach the destination, but if we can find somebody that can shed some light on things that, that potentially we haven't been able to see yet or give us some hacks, I'm all about the hacks. You guys know that if you've been following me, it's like, how can we get there faster, quicker? Um, what's the, what is the road of least opposition? So, you know, that's to me what this podcast is about. It's about having the difficult conversations. It's about talking about the controversial topics that are alive in the world today. And it's about giving you some practical application guidance tools and hacks to make your journey more simple, to make it easier, to make you able to reach your destination more quickly than you would without listening to me, without listening to this podcast. I want to talk a little bit about the matrix because it's something that I discuss quite a lot. And I think like when we think about the matrix, we're like, oh, you know, Neo Morpheus red pill, um, type of, of deal. And when I speak about the matrix, which it, you know, it's the easiest way. It's a, it's a short version of saying something that requires a long, uh, explanation. And so I'm going to give that explanation here in season one of the podcast. And so I'm going to give that explanation here, um, in episode one of season two of the podcast so that you know what I'm talking about as we move through, um, the season. So to me, when I'm talking about the matrix, what I'm discussing is the programming and conditioning that we have been raised in and that programming and conditioning keeps us operating inside a program that serves an elite group of people. So the, the purpose of the programming and conditioning is to support the global financial agenda. The global financial agenda does not support the collective. It supports an elite group of people that are in control um, and have power over basically everything we do from the medicine we take to the food we eat, to our financial institutions and organizations, to our government institutions and organizations, to our regulatory bodies. And we are raised to believe that those institutions and those organizations and those people operate in the highest and best good of the collective of the human beings that live on this planet. And that is simply not the case. So this matrix that we're existing in is essentially the web of lies and deception that keeps us playing small and operating as a compliant commodity. So from the time we are born and our parents register us with our respective governments, we essentially become property of that government. And our governments have the ability to go out and take loans um, and make financial transactions based upon the labor that we will provide in the future. So again, from like the time we take our first breath on this planet, we're already being programmed and conditioned to be compliant commodities. And most of us go through life doing a really, really good job of being compliant. So what does that look like? Well, we go to school and as we move into the educational system, we begin, we begin to be indoctrinated into the beliefs that serve the global financial agenda. So we believe that we have to go to school so that we can learn and that once we graduate high school or secondary education, then we should go to university or go to college. And we should do that by any means necessary. Um, yes, we should apply for scholarships if, if we've achieved um, academic excellence or athletic excellence, and we should apply for scholarships. And some of us are even lucky enough to get all of our education paid for. But the majority of us, you know, we may receive a partial scholarship and we then are encouraged to do whatever it takes to receive that university or college degree, including entering into agreements with the government 
um, and the, the financial institutions and organizations to provide us loans um, that we then pay interest on so that we can pay for our education. Now, obviously, this isn't everywhere in the world. Um, I'm American, so I'm speaking mostly to Western um, education. Obviously, we know there's some places uh, in the world that you can receive free education, and, and if you're in one of those places, then simply skip over this part and get to the next, because at some level, we're all being programmed and conditioned to operate inside this system. So we go to college. Um, and why do we go to college? Well, we go to college because we want to be able to get out of college and get a good job, right? We, we want to create safety, stability, and security for ourselves and for our family to be. And so we go to college and we graduate college and, you know, many of us leave with mountains of debt. Um, particularly if we choose to go into what I would call the preferred um, affluent occupations, a doctor, a lawyer, um, you know, even a teacher at some level, you know, can receive, um, you know, can go on to get master's degrees and, and things like that. So uh, I don't really believe that teachers are that revered within our um, hierarchy uh, and our structures, which is a damn shame because I think that teachers should be paid better than any other occupation, honestly. Um, but that would require us, you know, not looking at education as indoctrination. So we go to university and college with the dream of graduating and getting a good job. We get a job and the next phase is we're you know, working likely inside some kind of corporate structure where we are earning a wage or a salary and we are paying tax on that wage or salary to our government. And we are constantly striving for promotions and working hard and, um, and operating inside that system so that we can advance through the ranks so that we can have more safety, more stability, more security. And along the way, you know, we find a significant other and we decide that, you know, we want to get married and perhaps we want to start a family. Now, this obviously isn't everyone, but um, I'm using this model, which really is like the model of the American dream, right? Which um, you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. The American dream is not a dream. The American dream is a program. Um, don't get it twisted. So we meet someone and, and you know, we spark a love interest and then the programming and conditioning that's been activated in us our whole entire life that now it's time to get married and, and have some kids and, and buy a house um, and, and have a mortgage so that we're paying interest to the banks again. So it's like this next phase of life comes along, right? And it's like, okay, so we need a vehicle to get to and from work and so we're either leasing or purchasing a vehicle and usually we're financing that. So we are paying interest to financial organizations and institutions. We need a house to live in. So we're typically striving towards the ability to purchase a home um, that we have anywhere from 15 to a 30 year mortgage on where we don't actually own the home. We pay interest to financial institutions and organizations and they actually own the home. It's like they're leasing it to us until we pay it off. Um, and everything is set up for us to be constantly in financial exchange in a way that keeps us disempowered. So we're encouraged to open credit cards. We're encouraged to go into debt. Um, and at the same time, we are indoctrinated with the importance of keeping our credit score up. But through inflation and you know difficulties that face um, humanity at this time, and, and have quite frankly for years and years and years, it is very difficult for the majority of the population to maintain a good credit score. That in and of itself could be a whole ep podcast episode on its own because 
I believe that the that the credit score companies are one of the biggest problems that we have in our current financial system and structure because they are privately owned and they are incentivized and motivated to report negative marks on our credit reports and are not incentivized or motivated to mark positive marks on our credit reports. <coughs> this is like a little history of how we entered into the matrix, how we got to where we are, I guess, is what we're talking about and discussing today. Are you guys digging this little, how we got to where we are, history of the matrix history lesson today? Okay, so we are constantly striving for and attempting to achieve good credit um, good credit score so we can get more credit so we can extend ourselves even further so we can end up further in debt and We can continue to do what we've been programmed and conditioned to do which is pay interest to financial institutions and organizations and I think the the most insidious part of this programming is they want us to believe that they want us to have a good credit score they want us to believe that they want us to have the freedom to be able to get credit to purchase the things that we desire and that will make our lives easier. When the fact is, they actually don't want that. If you are struggling, if you have debt that you cannot pay, if you have a low credit score, you actually are being the most compliant commodity you can. And you're doing a damn good job of operating inside the program. Because the lower your credit score, the more leveraged you are with debt, the more in trouble you are financially, the more interest you end up paying, the more you're leveraged inside the system, the more that you can be controlled, the easier that you can be manipulated. And the purpose around all of this is to keep us extremely emotionally charged around money to keep us feeling disempowered, like money is controlling us, and like we do not have the ability to navigate or, it's not even navigate, we don't have, it's, it, it's to keep us feeling like we are not in control of the ship, that we are simply a passenger in our life. Um, and we aren't taught about money. I mean, notice in our indoctrination, in our, in our school systems, we're not taught about money. We're not taught about how to save, about how to leverage, about how to set up a scenario for ourselves where we are empowered when it comes to money. Those things aren't taught to us. And even if you go on to university and study economics, we look at bigger picture things. It's not practical applications for individuals to be empowered in their financial decisions and choices because that you being empowered doesn't serve the global financial agenda. You being empowered serves you. So this is the matrix. This is what we're living in. It's the web of lies, deception, and deceit that are designed to keep you operating as a compliant commodity inside the global financial agenda. And that agenda, again, serves an elite few group of people. It does not serve the collective. It does not serve humanity. It does not serve the beings of this planet. So that's where we are. And, you know, it's fucked. <laughs> And honestly, you know, it's extremely difficult to wake up to that and really have a full grasp of all the ways that we are controlled and manipulated. And it can be quite upsetting because the thing that we recognize and we realize is that we could not have so successfully been controlled and manipulated if the majority of that control and manipulation wasn't coming through our parents and our grandparents and the people that are closest to us in our life. And, you know, and while it's important to have compassion for them because they also received the same programming and conditioning from their parents and their grandparents, the time is now to stop this. 
It is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to see things as they actually are. It is time for us to take our power back. It is time to take back control of our financial destinies. It is time for us to be empowered in our financial choices and decisions. And it's time for us to establish and create a new relationship with money. One that we approach from a position of neutrality, not emotional charge. One where we're not assigning positive or negative associations to money. One where we're really just looking at it for what it is, which is energy and a neutral resource um, that's there to be used. It's there to be leveraged by us, not to leverage us. And so that's the work that I do in the world, you know, like that is this system that we operate in, it creates financial slavery consciousness. It creates a consciousness where even though it's on an unconscious level, we are slaves to a financial system and structure that doesn't serve us. And on top of that, it, this has carried on so long that we now exist in a state of financial internment. And these concepts and these, the languaging that I'm using right now, especially if you're still, you know, one foot in the matrix or a whole body in the matrix, it, it's going to sound a little bit harsh to you. And you're going to be like, whoa, like financial slavery consciousness and financial internment. Like these are pretty extreme terms. Make no mistake, I mean what I say. You are a slave. You are a slave to a financial system and structure that does not serve you and does not have your highest and best good um, at heart that actually doesn't even care about you. You are simply a number to them. And you are absolutely now living in a state of financial internment. This is the part that is, that is probably the scariest. Um, we are living in a state of imprisonment. Um, you know, the, the meaning of internment is like imprisonment of people commonly in large groups, right? And it's, it refers to like preventative confinement as well as the thing I think that's important here. It's like, not confinement after we've been connected, con convicted of some kind of crime, right? Um, and have been imprisoned because we've been convicted of some kind of crime. It's there to actually control us. Um, it, it's there to, you know, I mean, I, the most famous instances of this obviously are, you know, during World War II um, and, you know, the, the concentration camps and the internment camps, but it also, you know, existed during the 10 years war and the Philippine American war. And so this is not a new concept. What's new is to apply this to how we are being detained, um, imprisoned and confined when it comes to our ability to operate freely with our finances. Um, and it's done by governments, right? So, and it's done by people that governments have decided or identified are dangerous or un desirable. So the, our governments absolutely believe it is dangerous for us to be financially empowered. And it is absolutely undesirable for our governments for us to be financially empowered and independent and in financial sovereignty. The goal, right, is that we exist in a state of sovereignty. That is not what the global financial agenda supports, and it is not what the global financial elite are willing to accept. So we are intentionally being held prisoner. We are intentionally being confined within set limits of what we are able to do or not do when it comes to our personal 
finances. Um, and many of us feel very grateful for that internment because we've been programmed and conditioned to believe that we have the ability to create a life that we deeply desire. But that life that we think that we desire often is a program. And so my, you know, I think my, my biggest thing for you after listening to this is really to look at and, and start to begin to question all of the things that you've believed you've always wanted and ask yourself why and are those actually the things that make you happy because i know for me i was the epitome of a compliant commodity you know i was raised by a single mom in a single parent household where i saw my mom struggling and decided that i didn't want that for my family and so i ended up you know going to college incurring student debt, didn't actually end up graduating, right? So just went to college, incurred student debt, didn't end up getting the degree because I did realize like all along the way, I've seen these glimpses of the indoctrination. I've seen these glimpses of the program and I have had a spirit that fights and wars against control. And so, you know, I was like, well, I'm not really learning anything in school anyway. And so I decided to move to New York and start working in corporate America. So I moved to New York, I start working in corporate America, I get credit cards, I start incurring credit card debt. Um, I'm living a life well beyond my means in New York City, it's impossible pretty much not to, I think. Um, living a life well beyond my means in New York City, incurring debt, um, and you know, then ultimately end up having kids, getting married, um, and, and ultimately I build the life for myself that I thought I always wanted a life where I owned my own business. I, I employed lots of people. I had a husband, I had children. I had two extremely nice cars. I lived in a multi-million dollar house on the Hill. I was the president of the PTA. I was on the school board. I was on the board for, um, our local baseball league. I was volunteering at lots of different uh, charitable organizations that I cared about. I was attending all the fancy gala dinners um, and living the life that I was programmed to believe was the life that I was supposed to live. And I was miserable. And I couldn't figure out why, because I literally had achieved all the things that I believed I was supposed to or that I thought that I wanted that came from this indoctrination. And so as I started having my spiritual reawakening, I start the pieces started falling away and I started realizing that like this dream that I had was a dream that had been programmed into me, a dream that had been conditioned into me through my my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, you know, and it had come down to me um ancestrally through my DNA, right? The programming is strong. And so as I started stepping into personal sovereignty and empowerment and, you know, on my journey of my spiritual awakening, I realized that I actually didn't want any of those things and none of those things made me happy. So what I encourage you to do is really look at, you know, take a, take a detailed inventory of the life that you're currently living. Look at how you are operating as a compliant commodity. Look at where you are actually engaging in things and activities that you're not doing because you actually truly desire to. You're doing because you feel like there's no other way or you've always just been told that that's what you're supposed to do or you're doing it to be a good mother or a good wife or a good person. Um, anytime you've got a, a belief around to be a good insert whatever word here, wife, mother, person, friend, I need to do this. You need to really seriously look at that because that is programming and conditioning at its finest. See what you can learn about yourself. See where you are playing into a system that doesn't serve you and begin to ask yourself, if I was truly sovereign 
And I truly could make all the decisions that I desire to make in my life without having to comply with somebody else's belief, thought process, indoctrination, what would I be doing? What would my life look like? And begin to design that life. Begin to find small ways to exit from the program. And the first way to do that is by recognizing that you're operating inside one. Now, it's damn near impossible to completely exit the matrix. But what we can do is learn how to play inside it on our terms. And to me, that's what season two of the Wealth Witch podcast is going to be about. How to play inside the matrix on our terms. How to embrace our personal sovereignty. How to be empowered in our financial decisions. How to have freedom of choice when it comes to our economic realities. And I'm here and I'm committed to creating a new wealth paradigm where your economic freedom and your personal sovereignty is the reality. So I'm so happy that you chose to take this journey with me. Um, I'm excited for what the season has to bring. Until next time, this is The Wealth Witch signing off. Please remember that Wealth is a mindset and you are the most powerful creator in your reality. You are so worthy and so deserving of being wealthy in all areas of your life. It's your divine birthright. So now it's time to just go out and grab it.